Hey, Patrick. Hey, congratulations for 525.77. Thank you. Thanks. You know what? I do have to admit, I did not know what to expect. And this film totally surprised me. <laughs> Good. That's what I was hoping. That's great. <laughs> So um, it's 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 a delightful film, and I'm I'm proud that you actually got this out because I, I feel like you beat uh, Steven Spielberg with the favorite <laughs> ends that's coming out pretty soon. <laughs> I feel, my my quote I, I have two, and I hope Stephen will laugh at both of them. The first is, and he knows my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek. Is I am so honored that Stephen would go to all the trouble and all the expense to make a prequel to my movie it's so so moving <laughs> the, 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 the other one is if you see just one disaffected film geek trying to survive his little hometown mentality uh to be, and who's inspired by movies movie this year it should probably be the fablemans but if you see two <laughs> anyway that is great so so tell tell us this what is the origin story of this origin story of yours? <laughs> <laughs> well, the actual origin story is very funny because um, Gary Kurtz and I were introduced in 1990 when I got uh, my big deal at Universal where I was developing Dragonheart and other things. And, and we got along so well and liked each other's ideas so much that I actually like moved him into my bungalow at Universal and gave him half of the facility to set up offices. And we started partnering up on developing a bunch of projects. Um, and, and we would go out to lunch and I would pitch him ideas. And one of the things I pitched him was this thing called Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, which was just American graffiti in the seventies instead of the six, you know, the early sixties, you know, late 50s. it was, it was, you know, my American graffiti and he liked it. And he said, that's, I know why you want to do it. That's why we wanted to do American Graffiti, but it's not my world. It's your world, you know, so that's not for me. And I said, well, would it help if I added in this little extra detail? And I then told him what happened in March of 1977 when I went to Hollywood. And he went, <clears throat> and he was like, what? <laughs> he goes, wait a minute. When did you see Star Wars at ILM? And I said, you know, March something, 1977. He goes, you're the first person that didn't work on the movie to see it. Nobody had seen it by then. Nobody outside the circle. He goes, you're fan one. And I was like, oh boy. And he goes, he goes, why aren't we making that movie? That's the movie. <laughs> so I started, you know, when I moved back to Illinois in 1999, I, 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 I left Hollywood because I, I was just sick and tired of it, to be honest with you. And, and I was doing a lot of screenwriting and not a lot of directing and I could screenwrite on Mars. So why stick around? And I had my old home that I grew up in in Wadsworth, Illinois. So I bought it from my parents so they could move into something smaller and move my kids and my wife there. And we, I started taking drives on mm -hmm. summer nights in the car down the old country roads and the ghosts started showing up, you know, the, the ephemeral overlay of, of memory. And I couldn't help myself. I, I, I just had to write it. And so I, you know, beat out the first draft in 1999 and then spent a few years getting some money for it. And then we finally started shooting in 2004 and got about three quarters of the way through the film and just up to the part where we were going to shoot the Hollywood sequence when the, 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 the investor ran out of money. Hmm. And so we, we had 75% of the film, you know, we had the first act cut together. Then we had this slug line, third, 35 minute long slug line that said, Pat goes to Hollywood. You know, <laughs> So people would watch it and go, what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just, well, we'll come back. We're going to go get coffee. You watch the slug line. Then investors, we finally, two years later, found somebody willing to pony up the money we needed to, to do Hollywood. And then we did that. And then for 10 years, we, we got turned down, not because people didn't want to distribute the movie. We had plenty of people that wanted to distribute the movie. What they didn't want was to pay for the $200,000 worth of music the, you know, the, the pop songs of the day that we didn't want to replace with sound alikes or silence. And we literally just waited and waited and waited until finally MVD came in and said, you know, we'll pay for that. And uh, wh what? <laughs> okay. And that was 2020 and we got the money and we paid for the songs and here we are. Wow. Literally 20 years in the making um, for, for your film. That, that explains why I was like going, Gosh, how did they? How how did 
this guy made John Francis Daly look so young. <laughs> it's so funny. Somebody else just today did an did a uh, review of it who said, you know, obviously just like, you know, most and they had they had gone online and looked up the bios of the various actors who are now in their 30s and said, you know, like many films, this film employs a bunch of older people to play teens. I mean, John Francis Daly's 37, but he certainly looks 17, you know, and, and I had to write to him and say, he was, <laughs> I mean, well, he's actually 20, but it, you know, and I said, because a lot of people just don't know the backstory, which is okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's because you, 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 in, in the film, you actually met all these filmmakers Back then, uh, I mean, I, I can't even uh, grasp the idea of meeting these filmmakers today. <laughs> Let alone, well, and the, and the <clears throat> it's funny, too, because there's been talk about doing um, either a series, a limited series, like a, like a Mad Men for the 90s in Hollywood, because I get to, cause, because it's true and it's actually me. I didn't make this movie because people were waiting for the Patrick Reed Johnson story. Nobody was waiting for that, Right. But by keeping it me, I get to actually name the names and I get to really say what happened because you can't stop people from telling the truth. Right. And there's nothing negative in this film about anybody. But, you know, I mean, Stephen looks great and the guys at ILM look great. You know, um, the but the whole point was you could you could literally keep going with this and have John Francis Daly in his thirties in Hollywood in the nineties, making space invaders and then, be, and getting, you know, Steven Spielberg's approval. And suddenly he's got a three picture deal at universal. And then it all goes to hell with John Hughes. And, you know, and, and, and you know, so you could do, you know, five twenty five ninety, the empire strikes Pat, right. Where, <laughs> where the, the whole thing collapses in on itself and he moves back to Illinois. And then you do five twenty five Oh four return of the alumni which is where all his friends and everybody get back together to make 525.77. So <laughs> we might actually do this. <laughs> oh, well, that would be a very interesting. So how much, uh, how much support did you have from, you know, from, from the others that you incorporated in the film itself? Because, uh, because, you know, like people want, always want to do like some kind of star Wars sure. related stuff, but you know, getting the rights uh, or even, well, you know, I was fortunate enough that after Space Invaders, um, Fred Fred Roos, who was one of our other producers with Gary, obviously obviously Gary and Fred knew George Lucas really well, <laughs> and and George took me out to breakfast um, after watching Space Invaders because he was impressed by how much I got done for so little money and how fun it was in his mind. And 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 Stephen is the one who got it distributed, so those two really liked it. So I had an in there. Um, so. When it came time to do this film, Gary called George and told him about it. And he goes, oh, yeah, sounds fun. You know, let me know when I'll look at it when it's done. Well, when it was done or near enough to done to show uh, George to make sure we could secure the rights to all the Star Wars material, uh, we couldn't find Gary because Gary was off in Russia and Siberia somewhere like scouting locations for another movie. We couldn't find him and we needed this approval for a festival and blah, blah, blah. so. John Knoll, my good buddy who runs ILM and who grew up with me as a model maker in Hollywood and best man at each other's weddings, he goes, well, you know, I'll, I'll take it over and show George at the big house. So he took the movie over on his laptop and says, oh, George, do you mind if, uh, could you take a look at this real quick? And just the sequences that, you know, and, and he goes, Patrick wants to know if he can, you know, use this stuff in his movie. And George watched it and he goes, I think the answer is yes. You know, and, and the next day we got a letter from Lucasfilm saying, you're good to go which is insane. And then the Kubrick family, because, you know, we have that shot at the beginning of the movie, that one shot is the actual shot from 2001. And we're only the second movie in film history that they've ever given permission to use actual footage that wasn't in a documentary or something like that, but in a dramatic movie. I mean, it was uh, 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 Willy Wonka um, yeah. that got to use a little bit of footage in there before. Uh, but they, the Kubrick family, um, watched it and said, "Yes, we love this. This is great. Stanley would have loved this, you know," um, which is really huge for us. Um, and everybody else, I mean, like uh, Greg Jean, the famous model maker, you know, um, who had been a friend and I'd worked for him over the years. Uh, when it was time to make the movie, he said, "Well, I can let you borrow the little model of the mothership that sits on Stephen's desk. That little study model. That was the real model that sat on Stephen's desk." And so I had to go meet Greg Jean in a, in a T 
TGI Friday's parking lot in Marina del Rey and make the switch and get this special case that was designed for it and buy a seat for it on the airplane. And then he shipped me the actual Devil's Tower miniature from Close Encounters that he still had to use in the film. I mean, so people were incredibly supportive. You know, Douglas Trumbull uh, gave his support and, 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 and gave us all the storyboards in that hallway mm-hmm. shot. Those are the real storyboards from Close mm-hmm. Encounters. Yeah, they're not, it's not like we like Xeroxed something or made fake ones. Those are the actual ones that were up on the wall when I, you know, I I, I really needed that Hollywood sequence to be exactly as it was. You know, it, it was very important to not, and, 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 you know, you look at the movie and you think there's no way this could have happened or that could have happened. The truth is, is the weirder the thing in the movie and the wilder the thing in the movie, the truer it is. The stuff where it's just like connective tissue taking three years worth of events and collecting them down to, you know, collapsing them into one year. That's where I had to make stuff up. The rest is just true. That is amazing. You know, Patrick, I would love to talk to you for hours. I know they're they're like trying to signal me like, going, oh, you we know. can do it again. Anytime. Let me know. <laughs> I'm happy but, to come back. But, 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 but I, but, but I just want to mention one thing because, uh, I have to give credit your monologue about sitting in the movie theater, that escapism. You know, I've co- I've covered thousands of movies. That is spot on. I Thank I you. feel you about s- sitting with strangers in the Thank dark. You. That was it. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. And I'll, I'll guys, I'm gonna give me a second because that's important. Um, you know, sometimes when you're making a movie, you don't know what the thesis is until you're done, right? And it wasn't until I had recut that sequence, not for comedy, but for true to let, to let it be as, 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 as honest and as heartfelt as it could be. Right. And I let David Russo score it just beautifully. I mean, he originally didn't have music Mm. and I thought I'm not going to hit it over the head with music, but David did such a good job of taking it where it needed to go. And it's about movies which have music and sound and drama and everything. And everything about that scene was originally kind of tamped down and it worked, but it wasn't until I let myself believe everything he said from a completely non-cynical place that it finally worked. So I really appreciate that you appreciated that scene. Well, you you are one of the few people that uh, brought me into the movies with Dragon Heart and Space Invaders. That that's thank my you. childhood. So thank you, thank thank you, Patrick, uh, for speaking to me. It's, oh, it's a really a pleasure, and I will come back anytime if you want. Let me know. Okay, terrific. Thank, thank you. you. Nice meeting you, Gig.